In this video lecture, we are going to discuss the foundational elements that underlie the concept of loops. Loops allow us to perform repetitive tasks. And this is one thing that computers are really great at, doing something over and over and over again really, really, really fast. So the concept of loops uh, is going to be something that's very important to us this semester and something that we're going to um, really benefit from having in our toolbox. So let's talk about um, what types of repetitive tasks we might want to use loops for. I'm going to break these down into two categories. The first category of repetitive task that I'm going to define or I'm going to call an undefined repetitive task. And what I mean by that is an undefined repetitive task is one where we need to perform a task but we don't really know how long that task is going to be performed. So it'd be like if you went to work and the boss said, hey, I need you to come in today and I need you to stay until all the work is done. Well, maybe you'll get it done really fast and you'll be able to leave in two hours or maybe there's a lot of work and you'll be there for 20 hours. You just don't know um, because your goal is to process all of the work that is available, um, but the specific amount of time or the specific number of items that you have to perform is undefined. So in this case, we know where the task begins, um, but we might not be clear exactly on where the task ends, right? We might say to somebody, hey, enter all of the places that you've worked in your career. Well, some people maybe have worked nowhere. Other people maybe have had many jobs. We just don't know how many items we're going to process. So we have to perform a repetitive task uh, of, of reading those items in, uh, but we don't know where they end. So again, another example that I've got in this slide is count the total number of books in this library. Well, we know we're going to start somewhere, but we don't know how many books there are. So we're essentially going to say, while there are more books to count, keep counting. So you say one book, look next to it. Is there another book to count? Yes. Okay. Now we've got two books. Okay. While there are more books to count, keep counting. Look next to that book. Are there more books? Yes. Three books. Keep counting. Is there another book next to that book? Yes, four books. Keep counting until eventually we get to the end of the library and there are no more books. So the range of which we'll be performing this repetitive task is undefined. The other category then will be defined repetitive tasks. These are tasks where we know exactly how many items we need to process. And that is very clear to us, that we know that we're going to be, you know, uh, if it's a program to process a baseball team, uh, we know that we would be processing nine players for those on the field. Uh, we know exactly how many items uh, there are. Uh, or let's say, for example, we want to process um, everyone in a sold-out movie theater. Well, if we know the number of seats and we know that all of the seats are sold, that's really not an undefined problem. That's a defined problem. We know the specific number of people that we need to process or the number of people that bought tickets. So anytime we can define the range, we know where we start, we know where we're going to end, that's going to be a different type of repetitive task. And something like this would be calculate the average grade for all students in this course section. Well, if I know there's 20 students enrolled in the course, I know that I'm going to have to calculate 20 grades. I'm going to start at student one, and I'm going to go all the way to student 20. So for each student in this course, find the sum of all their grades, and then divide that sum by the total number, um, <laughs> by the total number uh, of assignments given. To handle both of these situations, we're going to have two loop constructs. We're going to call them while and for loops. And so while loops, you'll note, are going to be utilized for undefined repetitive tasks, and for loops are going to be used for those defined repetitive tasks. Regardless of the type of loop that we're using, we're going to need to deal with some requirements when performing a repetitive task. We need to know where to begin. Do we start with the first student? Do we start with the first book in the library? Do we start, and maybe we did some counting yesterday, so today we're going to start in a different section of the library. But we always need to know where to start our repetitive tasks from. Additionally, we're going to use a conditional statement to determine if the loop should continue or stop. So we're going to be asking questions every time through the loop. Should I keep going? Should I keep going? Should I keep going? And how we specifically ask that question, what does it mean that we should or should not keep going, that's always going to be a challenge with writing uh, loops. So that's going to be one of the things that we're going to focus on. And we're going to use the same operators and same thought process that we used last week when talking about conditional statements. But now we're, we're going to use those conditional statements in the context of a loop. 
And then one other thing to point out is that you, the programmer, is responsible for making sure that the loop will at some point stop. So for example, if we're counting all the books in the library, well, you better remember where you started so you don't start recounting books you've already counted. So an example would be putting a chalk mark or putting some uh, you know, paper or tape or a mark to know which sections you've already counted. Otherwise, you'll, you may just end up recounting sections over and over again and infinitely counting books because you don't know where you started, so you don't really know when you've ended. So you as a programmer who write the loop, you're going to be responsible for figuring out what is the condition that stops the loop and then making sure that you have code available that lets you get to that condition to stop the loop. Otherwise, you end up with an infinite loop, which, by the way, isn't necessarily always a bad thing. But for most of the assignments that we perform, uh, we're going to want to be able to have a way to get out of our loop. While loops, as I said previously, are utilized for undefined repetitive tasks. And the syntax of a while loop that we'll see in a little bit when we get to our examples in visual logic is going to provide uh, some a way for us to define the specifics that are required for performing an undefined repetitive task. So the syntax of a while loop is going to basically only provide space for us to define a conditional statement by which the loop continues. So the syntax specifically is just going to give us the opportunity to ask the question. It's going to be our job as the programmer outside of the while loop syntax to define where that loop starts and how to progress uh, towards the condition that will then terminate our loop. Um, the only thing the syntax is going to give us is the condition. When it comes to for loops, because these handle defined repetitive tasks, those with a clear beginning and a clear end, we're going to see that the syntax for a for loop will provide us with the ability to identify our starting point, identify the conditional statement that will stop our loop or indicate that it should keep going, and also give us some space for us to indicate how we should progress towards getting to that terminal condition. So because a for loop provides this very defined way of looping through a set number of items, uh, the syntax is going to reflect that. Whereas the while loop, it's a little bit looser. We don't know how long it's going to go. The syntax will reflect that as well. With that said, guidelines and any rules that I give you are always meant to be broken. It is possible for you to use a while loop uh, with a defined range of items. And it is also possible for you to use a for loop for an undefined range of items. And as you move forward, you'll probably get more or less comfortable with one style of loop over another. Uh, the more you program, you'll end up comfortable with both styles of loops. But the reality is, um, one thing to note is that what I'm giving you are guidelines. Uh, and it's not uncommon that you'll see these broken. Uh, and actually being able to write uh, a solution that uses a while loop and rewrite it using a for loop and vice versa is actually a really great way um, to learn the differences and different restrictions uh, or kind of nuances of each loop that we're dealing with. Which loop should you choose? Well, at this point, if your code works, you have made the correct choice. We're not going to worry too much about choosing one loop over another. The goal in this course is to get working code. We'll talk about pros and cons of solutions that you've chosen, but in reality, we want to have running code, and then from there we can discuss what might be a better um, solution for a given problem. So what I recommend that students do in this course is pick the loop that they understand best and only use that loop for right now. So if you really understand while loops when we get to that section uh, in Visual Logic and you're looking at them and they just kind of click for you, stick with using them at first. If you look at for loops and they work better uh, for your brain, then stick to using those initially. Once you're really comfortable with one loop, you can then go on and try to understand the other type of loop. And a really great exercise is to go back and take solutions that you've written using, say, a while loop and rewrite them using a for loop. Or stuff you've written using a for loop and rewrite them using a while loop. So don't be too concerned about uh, which one you want to choose or having to use you know, half of this loop or half of that loop. Uh, for assignments, I will make you use specific loops for certain uh, solutions. But in general, if you're not sure what to use, take the one that you're most comfortable with and we'll work on uh, you know, solving any questions you might have about the other loop um, as we move forward. So let's talk about some terms. The first thing I want to discuss is an infinite loop. An infinite loop is a loop that goes on forever. It never ends because the conditional that is supposed to tell the loop to stop never, ever, ever evaluates to false. In other words, it's always true. So if the condition for the loop to continue is always true, therefore the loop will never execute. 
Sometimes we want to have loops that do execute forever, uh, but in most cases, we're going to want to have our loops terminate. So we want to avoid infinite loops. Uh, one infinite loop is also the address of Apple Computer. So now you know where that address comes from. Loop control value. It's a value used by the loop conditional statement to determine if the loop should stop or keep going. So most of our infinite loops are going to be caused by a failure to um, appropriately uh, change or modify the loop control value. In other words, um, that value needs to approach the condition um, that will make our loop stop. And if it doesn't, or that, that, that loop control value never gets set to the value that makes our loop stop, then we have an infinite loop. So we're going to have a value or series of values that control whether our loop should continue or stop, and we need to make sure they're being updated appropriately. Another term to know is sentinel value. This is a value that indicates the end of data to be processed. So a good example of a sentinel value is we might ask the user to enter a negative one when they're done, or enter the word done when they're done. Or if we're reading data from a file, there might be an end of file or some string that just says end of file, EOF, to indicate that we're done. So this will be some value agreed upon by the programmers uh, that will indicate that the loop is done processing. That sentinel value could be uh, the actual loop control value. They can be one and the same, and they usually are because the sentinel value says, hey, uh, we have, you know, it, it indicates that we've reached the end of something um, because we've determined what it means to reach the end of something. We see a negative one, uh, which therefore sets that loop control value to negative one and exits our loop. So first up, I'm probably going to use the term counter a lot. And a counter is going to be a special variable um, that we're going to use within our loops to basically just count how many times we've repeated a task. So if we are, if our goal is to uh, count all of the books in the library, the counter would be the variable that would keep track of how many books are in the library. So a counter, most of the time you'll increment it or decrement it by one, um, but it's just there to keep track of a total number of items. There's the accumulator. An accumulator is a variable used to keep a running total or a running uh, of a number of values. Uh, I was about to say a tally, but the counter is the tally. So a variable keeps a running sum or a running product of a number of values, um, a running difference, whatever. Um, so if you are checking out at the register as the person is uh, ringing up your items, what you'll notice at the bottom of the cash register screen as the total updates, the total amount of items that you purchased, we would call the total in that, on that register screen the accumulator because it's accumulating the sum of the cost of all of the items that you are purchasing. Exit. We talked that loops are going to use a conditional, and that is going to determine when a loop should stop looping. But sometimes we need to break out of it early. We need an exit. So let's say, for example, you need to work eight hours today, but you get sick at lunchtime. You're going to have to exit work early. You need to stop at noon because you're sick and you go home early. So anytime we need a situation in a program where we're looping over items, but something arises that means we need to stop unexpectedly or expectedly, we're just kind of done. We don't think we need to do any more work. Um, we're going to use an exit statement. And um, this allows us to basically shortcut the main conditional and get out of a loop uh, prematurely. Another item we'll discuss in context of while loops is going to be the pre and post test. Each time through the loop, we're going to check our conditional to determine if we should or should not continue to loop. The question is going to be, should we check that conditional before we start executing our commands, or should we check that conditional after we check those commands? In other words, should I see if I should keep going before I process an item, or should I see if I should keep going after I process an item? So when we ask the question, right, um, did you ever, you know, it'd be like eating dinner and then asking if you were hungry. Well, that probably doesn't make any sense because you just ate dinner. Usually you would want to ask if you were hungry before you ate dinner. So whether we ask if we should keep looping before we process something or after is going to be a consideration that we'll have to make when executing our loops. Uh, and we'll see that in some of the examples and we can talk about the ramifications that that has. In a separate lecture, we'll talk about nested loops. And what I mean by this is having one loop construct nested inside of another. And this is very obvious to see in a tool like Visual Logic. Just like we could put one conditional statement inside of another statement, we can put loops inside of loops. So an example of this would be, to going back to my previous average um, for student grades example, 
uh, for each student in this class, add up all of their grades, and calculate their average. Well, that's actually two separate loops. I need one loop, the first item here, to loop through all of the students in the class. So it's going to need to start at student 1 and go through student 20. But the second loop that I'm going to need is if I'm looking at just student 1, I then need to loop over all of the assignments that they've submitted that semester. So for student 1, I need to loop over the five or six assignments that they submitted this semester. And then I go back out and I get student 2. And then I get back to loop number two and I add up all of the assignments that they did that semester and calculate its average. So I've got two loops here. One that loops through all the students and then for each given student I have a loop uh, that goes through each of their specific grades so that I can calculate their overall average. Some common loop tasks that we'll perform this semester or that are good to know about uh, is we can use loops to do things like add up a bunch of values pretty helpful, especially if we want to do things like find an average uh, or perform other calculations. We can count a bunch of values or actions. Hey, how many people are currently enrolled in the course? How many people bought tickets? Uh, and so on. We can process a bunch of values in some way. Go through every customer in our database and apply a 10% discount to their next order. Or, you know, oops, we have a bad product. Go through everybody that purchased an item and uh, issue a refund. The next up item, we can look at a bunch of values to f find a specific value. So this would be along the lines of, is there a person in this class named Jason? And we could loop through all the people in the class uh, and say, oh, hey, that is, um, that is, there is a person named Jason. We'll actually talk later on about how to store things in a list. But for right now, this is one of the things that we can do is use it to just kind of search through uh, in a linear fashion a lot of information. Uh, and then finally, we can just perform general specific tasks repeatedly until a certain condition is met. Um, so let's say, for example, you try to log into a website. Uh, and we could say something like, um, you know, until you enter a valid username and password combination, try again. Until you enter a valid username and password condition or a you know, combination, try again. So we can use loops as well to do things like constantly prompt uh, a user uh, for the correct input. These are just a small sampling of things we can do with loops, uh, but just something to kind of give you an idea of the scope of the different things that are possible using uh, this programming construct.